Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm an implementation engineer at NetGain Technology. Um, we're a hosting company, so we build like, brand new environments for every client we get. Um, it's my Twitter handle. I don't really tweet much, but I have been meaning to start doing that more. Um, and then uh, the slides are up on Sked right now, um, and they will be on GitHub soon on that, in that repository. There's nothing in there yet, but that's where all the code will be after I clean it up a bit. Um, just a, doing a very brief overview of what a pipeline is, just so you can kind of follow along here. Um, so the first step we're going to do is commit code to whatever source control repository you have. Um, if you're not using source control already, please do so. Um, it will save you many headaches. Um, once you commit that code to source control, there's a, some piece of integration that will actually uh, trigger your CI job, so the Jenkins job. Um, uh, the next step, that uh, CI job or Jenkins job is going to run any uh, unit or integration tests that you've written, um, probably in Pester if you're here. And then uh, record the results. So it'll actually record it in the, the Jenkins job as well as uh, send a status message back to your source control repository let, letting you know whether that build passed or not. Um, and I just said that. So yeah, once the uh, job succeeds, all your unit tests have completed. Um, it's gonna mark that job as a success and then uh, do the deploy step, whether that's deploying code out to your management servers um, or wherever you need that code. And then if the job fails, uh, stop doing anything else and just mark it as failed. Um, this is just a quick uh, prereq setup for um, the Jenkins environment that I set up in my lab. Um, you install Jenkins, of course. There's a pretty good guide on that on Jenkins' website. Um, and then these are the plugins I'm using. So I'm using, uh, we're using GitLab for our source control system. So I'm using that plugin. That's what uh, can trigger the Jenkins build. Um, we're using the NUnit plugin to record your Pester test results. Uh, the pipeline plugin, um, while this isn't necessarily required, it is required for this demo. Um, this is where you're writing the Jenkins job itself with, uh, um, in Groovy code instead of going through the GUI and clicking all the add step um, options. It also gives you much more features. You can put if statements in there. You can do a lot more. And this one's also not really required. I just put it in there. Um, this will clean up the Jenkins workspace on the server that Jenkins is running on um, before the build starts. That way, any artifacts that are left over, they get wiped out. And then we're using uh, VMware for the VM build portion, so we're using uh, PowerCLI for that. All right, and that's all the slides I have. Uh, before I go to the demo, I'm gonna just give a quick overview of why we're actually even using Jenkins. So uh, my coworker, Matt Goldman, who's actually here today, um, after the very first PowerShell Summit, um, he came back with this awesome new technology heard of called DSC. And it wasn't released yet, but he had seen a bunch of demos and kind of knew how to write the modules. So as soon as he got back, we actually started writing DSC resource, custom, custom DSC resources that we knew we were gonna use um, before DSC was even released. So as soon as it was released, we were able to just start consuming it. Um, so at first, when we started using DSC, it was a very basic uh, configuration. We had, you know, maybe it was promoting uh, domain controller and installing a few Windows features, maybe cha making a couple registry changes, such as uh, making sure RDP is enabled, making sure the firewall is off on some of our servers, um, that sort of thing. Um, as soon as we started adding more resources, or as, yeah, as we added more resources, the configuration got, uh, started to get a lot more complex. Um, today it's about 1,500 lines, something like that. Um, and so as soon as we started adding more, um, we started having more errors. So we'd have some, you know, since we're building a brand new environment for every one of our clients, we're building a new forest and you know, a couple domain controllers that, some backend servers, uh, some RDS servers, and then, uh, so we have a lot of depends on. So you have to wait for the domain controller to come up before you can join the domain, that sort of thing. And we started getting errors and since 
Matt and I were the only ones who were using DSC, we would have to stop what we were doing, troubleshoot the error, possibly revert the code, and then manually push, that, uh, push the scripts that we're using out to all of our management servers that the techs are actually running DSC from. Um, so we didn't like getting interrupted every few days to do that, um, which is why we started looking into a pipeline to automatically test our code and automatically deploy that if it's working and then just not deploy it if it's not. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so that's basically it. Uh, demo time. All right, so if you're using DSC, you're probably uh, familiar with the configuration data. Um, this is what contains all of the you know, environment-specific or server-specific uh, properties that you're not gonna hard code into your DSC configuration itself. So it's a pretty basic one. Um, I'm gonna skip that function for now. I'll get to that in a second. So we're basically putting the, yeah, putting the client name in, giving it a domain name, setting some IP addresses. Um, oh. That is odd, all right. All right, sorry about that. All right, so here's a few of the properties, domain name, IP address, um, Retry count is gonna, this, the member servers are gonna retry that many times um, before uh, giving up on joining the domain. Uh, the certificate file for encrypting credentials, and then each one of these nodes is a server we're gonna build. Um, and then the server role is what, you know, what role we're gonna install, RDS, a primary domain controller, and a connection broker server. Um, I will quickly go over what this function is. So we found, we're using the configuration data variable that we build um, for both our VM build as well as the uh, DSC the, generating the MOF files. And what we found was as soon as we generated the MOF files using the configuration data variable, it wiped out the first item in the all nodes array. So this, this global, settings, global settings section here. Um, so in order to do that, we are actually, this function we found online to de serialize and then deserialize that this hash table in order to uh, make multiple copies of that variable. All right. All right, I'm gonna hop over to the actual Jenkins pipeline code itself. Um, we're using the more complicated syntax, I guess you'd call it. Um, you can write uh, a pipe pipeline code in a little more uh, user-friendly, I should, I guess, or more basic um, mode. This one allows me much more functionality or flexibility by being able to, you know, use if statements, um, doing things in parallel, that sort of thing. So start started off with pipeline. Agent means what agent do I want my, uh, do I want the Jenkins job to run on? Uh, we only have a single agent, so I just left it as any. The stages section here is just, uh, you can split up your build into different stages like test, build, deploy. Um, so this first test section is where you're actually, I'm defining a couple uh, objects here for the, all the repos that I want to um, clone down every time a change is made. Since we're, we're building VMs, we're doing DSC, um, I, need to, you know, I need to get all these modules. I need to get the Active Directory module, I need to get the computer, mo computer management module, our custom module containing all our custom resources, as well as the uh, script that we're using to create the new VMs. And depending on how many of those you're checking out, that can actually take a while, so we're actually doing that in parallel. Um, I'm not gonna get too in-depth on that. There's a, pretty, there's a couple of pretty good articles online about that. You can just Google uh, parallel Jenkins pipeline or parallel Groovy, something like that but basically it is just going to check them all out at the same time. Um, after it does that, it's gonna send a quick status message over to our GitLab uh, source control server saying that the uh, repository build is in a pending state. 
and then it's going to run a couple scripts. So this netgain DSC pester is a script that runs pester tests for our custom DSC module. All right. <laughs> um, I'll actually get to that in a second. I'm just going to go through the rest of this script quick just to show you what it's doing before I get to the output. Um, the next script it's going to run is going to compress our modules and send them out to a staging uh, directory. Um, this build stage is actually doing uh, most of the heavy lifting here. We've got this with credentials block here is just telling me run all the steps within this block with these credentials. Um, these credentials are saved in encrypted form on the Jenkins server. Um, there's, they're used for things like the domain admin, the Active Directory store mode password, local admin password, as well as our vSphere uh, credentials. Uh, okay. And then these are the scripts. This parameterized build script is actually going to kick off the MOF um, generation process, as well as the VM build. Um, if that's all successful, it's going to run our remove script, which is going to actually remove those VMs. If that succeeds, deploy the code out to our management server using another script. And then at the end, it's going to record the results, no matter if the job failed or not, and then send that status message over to, to GitLab. All right. And since I was not able to get vSphere and vCenter all running on my laptop, I actually have videos for that output. I was close. I couldn't get vCenter to add the uh, ESXi host for some reason. All right. All right, so here you can see um, this is the Jenkins interface. Uh, I've got the build that I created. It's called All Tests Pipeline. Um, it's going to basically just because it runs all the tests. I'm going to go in and configure that. Here's where it's telling me uh, what GitLab server I want to connect to. You set this up ahead of time. Um, basically, it's just the uh, URL to your GitLab server and um, the credentials you're going to use. Um, this is going to show you uh, that it's any time a change is pushed to GitLab, kick off this job. Um, this URL you'll um, this URL you see in a second that you you will actually enter that URL into the GitLab Jenkins integration section. And then um, I'm actually just pasting the pipeline code itself in within the job. Oops. Instead of uh, you can also use what's called a Jenkins file that's saved in the same repo that you're you're monitoring for changes. Anytime a change is pushed, it just runs that Jenkins file there, whatever code is contained within that. Um. Yes, there is a reason. Um, since we're doing more than just running like pester tests against a single repository, we're, we're, we want to build an entire environment every time a change is made to one of like five repositories. So I didn't want to put a, that same Jenkins file in every single one of them. Um, you, I haven't looked into this, but you can probably use a, uh, like a sub, like a, a separate repository for the Jenkins file. I just haven't looked into that piece yet. Um, here, I'm going to just show you the output um, from a successful build. I'm going to go through a couple uh, where you'll actually see me committing code and having that kick off the job. This one was just the one that takes the longest, so I'm just going to quickly go through the output, and then as I get to each script, I'm going to show you each script that's running. So here's the output of the job. Uh, you can see that it was, it was created from a push to GitLab, <coughs> deleting the workspace. All these items are, this is all the, the repos that it is uh, cloning down in parallel. So when it does those tasks in parallel, does it get jumbled up in that time block? The, yeah, the output does get jumbled up a bit um, because it's uh, sending it whenever, it whenever it wants. Just like uh, PowerShell jobs, if you do a receive job, it's going to just jumble all that. Unless you do some other fun. I have a question. So I built like some basic pipeline stuff for some of my tasks, but it's all using like the Jenkins GUI. Like you know, it, it, this depends on this, depends on this. I have not even looked at touching Ruby script. Um, in your experience, Ruby script gives you a lot more flexibility. I guess is that. So yep. The so the question was. Um, does using the Groovy script give you a lot more flexibility than just going through the GUI and you know setting up all the uh, 
dependencies and the, the steps there. Um, yes, it gives you way more flexibility. Um, you can't, that I've seen, do an if statement in the GUI anywhere. Um, you can't do things in parallel like I showed you. Um, and then you can't track those changes. So that's another reason why we're doing it in pipeline. We want to know when the Jenkins job itself is changing. Um, Yep. Um, so for those that are used to the, the GUI, there's a, a Ruby syntax explorer or whatever. So you can legitimately build a GUI script, one line that can replicate what you normally do through the, the, the job, like a regular job, into a Ruby script just line by line. Even if you're not doing parallelizing, if you're not doing pipeline or complicated stuff, just to get you over to the Ruby script that you can put in source control at that point. What's it called? It's a yep, I'll, it's a plugin? Nope, it's, it's built in. I'll, I'll actually, if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll go through that. Um, so the comment was, if you're using the GUI um, and you're just getting started with the pipeline or you want to start using the pipeline, as soon as you create a pipeline job, there's a link on the left-hand side that will, uh, it's called like the pipeline syntax, where it will have you give you a drop down of all of the, all of the steps that support pipeline, um, like the checkout step, uh, PowerShell step, batch step, that sort of thing. Click on one of those, you can fill out all the same options that you would see in the GUI, hit generate, and it actually generates the pipeline code for you. So you can just copy and paste that into your pipeline script and use it. And if we have, yeah, if we have time, I will, uh, I'll show that at the end. All right, so. After checking out the code, it's actually going to run our first script, that NetGain DSC Pester script, which I will bring up here. So this script um, is almost, uh, pretty much stole this from Microsoft's DSC repository, and almost word, or almost line by line. Um, they're using AppVar up in GitHub for all of their DSC, DSC resources. Um, they have a bunch of generic pester tests that runs on any, all their resources. So I'm going out there, um, changing my location to my custom DSC module, cloning down the, DSC, the generic DSC resource tests from Microsoft's GitHub repository. Um, that will actually create a subfolder within the NetGain, uh, the, within our custom DSC module. I'm going to switch over to that directory, run their helper script, uh, which does a few things that I'm not going to get into. <laughs> um, so change the location back to your custom module, install NuGet, install Pester, and then I'm defining which tests I actually want to run. Uh, this I just added for the demo because I wanted to exclude, there was recently a container script that was added uh, that was make, causing my demo to fail. So I removed that one. Um, it's all, yeah, so they have a bunch of analyzer rules. They are t checking to make sure your opening brace is on the right line and your, your DSC resources are in a certain format. A um, lot of things. It, it's, they're, they're constantly adding more, so it, it will definitely uh, extend the, uh, the time it takes for your job to complete. And then here I'm just adding the uh, the custom tests, pester tests I wrote for the, our custom module. And then invoking pester against that, giving it an output file. This, in, this environment variable um, is the Jenkins workspace that, it, that we cleared out before the job ran. And then uh, it's gonna, that's where it's going to save everything, all of your, your uh, cloned repositories, that sort of thing. Hop back over to the video. So you'll see that it's actually, whoa, I think I went down a little too far. Let's go back here. There we go. Something happened. All right. Okay, there's running the pester test. And here's all, I'm not going to show them all, but here's just a snippet of some of the tests that's, writing, or that's running. As you can see, these are all passing. It's quite a few of them. And then... Is it running integration tests too, or is it... Um, I am only running the unit tests for Pester. Um, my VM build, I'm treating as an integration test because if there's any errors at all, it 
fails the build. Yep. So you can see here it passed 202 tests, skipped 22. The, the skipped ones were uh, basically optional tests that Microsoft had. You have to opt into them if you want them to actually run. Uh, here was the, so the next script was the compress modules. Let me. So this one's another, another very basic script. All it's doing, I can hop over to it quick. So all it's doing, it's compressing all of the modules we're using for our build, the, our custom module as well as some of the Microsoft modules. Um, compressing them all into a zip file so that we can easily send that over to uh, our VM, or inject that into our VM. Um, the reason we're using, we're compressing it is just because it's faster. It takes a while if you're doing it file, file by file. So it's compressing that, and then it's actually copying that over to a staging directory that we can, that our VM script can pull it from. Launch output for that. All right, the next step is this parameterized build script. So this is the script that's actually going to generate the DS, the MOFs, and build the VMs, inject the MOFs, that sort of thing. Uh, I'll hop over to that. So this one here. Um, ignore part of this stuff. <laughs> I was having trouble with my environment variables, and it was it was. When it cloned down like the X Active Directory module, it was already installed. It was installed in the Jenkins, the C program files, Windows PowerShell modules folder. So it was seeing duplicate ones. So I'm just I'm wiping out the environment variables, setting certain ones, uh, making sure I'm importing. Uh, let's see here, making sure I'm importing the modules that I cloned down. Oh, that's right here. Um, adding the the uh, modules file, the modules that I cloned down, adding that to the environment var variable so I can use them. Um, here I'm just creating some uh, PS credential objects from the credentials saved in within Jenkins itself. Just doing a quick uh, for each just because I didn't want to duplicate code, of course. Um, so this DSC wizard script um, right here. So this is a, what you'd call a controller script. This is actually generating the MOFs and then building the VMs with a few parameters. I'm giving it a, that configuration data uh, file that I showed earlier, um, giving it the credentials, saying where the VM script actually is going to run from, where the LCM configuration data is, where the DSC configuration is, all of that. And I'll hop over there. So this one's actually going, so it's going to dot source that configuration file. So we have the configuration data and the other two um, configuration variables available, available for us to use. Um, we've got a couple passwords saved just locally uh, in, in encrypted form, so we're going to import those. Uh, this is the, looks like the password for the, the cert we're using to encrypt our MOF files, or encrypt the passwords within the MOF files. <coughs> Um, so here you can see we're dot sourcing the VM build script, the LCM configuration file, and the DSC configuration file, generating the meta.mof files, or the LCM, uh, generating the normal DSC mof files, and then running, actually before I move on to that, I can just show you the quick DSC configuration we're actually using for this. It's pretty basic. We're building a domain controller. Um, if, it's, if that role matches a domain controller, we're going to add that feature. We're going to, what time is it? All right. Uh, install, build the domain, uh, set up some replication. This is a, the custom resource I chose to demo. Um, this will just set the replication interval to 15 minutes on your site object. Uh, and then these are the member servers. Anything that's not a DC is going to wait for the domain to become available and then join it. And then I have the uh, remote desktop services server services 
um, connection broker, add the connection broker feature. That's pretty much it for that one. Like a couple RSAT feature or licensing features. Uh, the RDS is going to build the, uh, it's a 2016 RDS deployment and configuration. So we're gonna wait, we gotta wait for the connection broker. We got to, and then we build the deployment and do a, phone, a few other configuration steps, but we don't really need to go over those. Um, once it does, does that, it kicks off our new VM script. So that I'm, uh, let's see here. I'm not gonna go into the new VM script. That will take a whole 45 minutes by itself. Um, I will share, I'm gonna share a version of that out there. Um, it is built pretty strictly for our environment. Um, I'm gonna try to clean it up so that it's more generic that anyone can use it. Um, all right, let's hop back over to the video. So you can see here, it generated the meta-moth files, generating the normal moth files, or I don't even know what you'd call those, the DSC moth files. Uh, here we're generating the VMs, building the VMs, and within the actual VM build script, um, in order to get the status messages and errors, we're actually doing a, uh, if you're familiar with VMware and PowerCLI, there's an invoke VM script command. We're running that every, I think we're running it and waiting five seconds and then running it again until DSC completes. So we're going in there, we're, uh, let's see here, let's hop down a little bit. So you can see here we're copying, uh, I wish I had a highlighter or something. Nope, all right. Um, we are copying the DSC resources into the VM. We are copying the certificate in. We are installing the certificate in the certificate store. All right, good, I did highlight it. Um, enabling the analytic log, that's what's going to tell us what step DSC is actually on. So you'll be able to see here all the verse, verbose messages that get saved out in the DSC analytic log. We're actually pulling that down so that we can see where it is. If it's running for a long time, we can see, oh, it's sitting there waiting for the domain. All right, I can wait until that's done. So you can see here, it'll tell, um, in order to tell whether DSC is complete or not, um, we had this all built before we had, I think it was Power, or WMF5 added the get DSC configuration status. Before that, there was not really an easy way to know when DSC actually completed successfully. So we were actually just querying, the, querying for that current .ma file out in the C Windows System 32 configuration folder. Once it sees that it's there, it writes out the verbose message saying DSC is complete. And then once all of the nodes are complete. There you go, you can see they're all complete. Um, it'll output any errors if there were any. And then it's, uh, so no errors happened. Uh, the pester tests all, all succeeded. So then it's gonna move on to our next script to actually remove those VMs because this is, these are just used for our pipeline. They're not used for any production use or anything like that. So I'll hop over to that script for quick. That's a very, another pretty small script. Uh, Yes, yep. Yeah, so nothing else, it's actually a separate VLAN, so nothing else can talk to that. Uh, so this is the remove script. Um, again, we're setting some environment variables. Creating a credential object to use, the vSphere credentials is all we really need. And it's dot sourcing our configuration file so it knows what VMs uh, we need to remove. And then just, uh, let me, and then uh, just removing the VMs. This remove environment script is really just a, okay, it does do a little bit more than I thought. <laughs> yeah, logging into vCenter and then doing a stop VM, remove VM. So pretty simple. All right, so that's the end of that video. What do we got here for time? All right. So I've got another, a few other videos that are just showing a few other scenarios on actual, actually uh, committing the code and seeing what happens when errors occur. All right, so here we're logged into GitLab. Um, 
Um, this is just the, the summit group I created. Here's our custom module. Oh, and I'm going to quickly show you the, uh, where you set up the Jenkins integration within GitLab. It's built in. You don't have to install any plugins or anything. It's a pretty simple setup. Check the box for active. Put in that URL that I showed earlier from the, the Jenkins job itself, and then the name, of the name of the job or the project. And I'm going to make a quick change just within GitLab itself. Um, usually, you would use you know, VS Code or something else to edit that. Oh, and also, you can see that the build has failed up here. That's the little icon that Jenkins adds. So here, I'm just going to add, a, or I'm just going to make a quick breaking change. What am I doing here? Changing a not equals to an equals in one of the DSC resources in the in the test. So this is actually going to show a uh, pester test failing. All right, so I committed that right to master, like everyone does, right? No. <laughs> Um, down here, you can see in the Jenkins interface um, for this job, you can see the build history. You'll see that it changes from pending to building here. And I'm going to jump over into that. You can see that it started by a GitLab push. Jump over to the output. Checks out all the same repos. Uh, clones the resource tests again, or the, yeah, the resource pester tests again. Which is taking a little while. Installing NuGet. Come on. <laughs> and then running the tests. So I'm not going to wait for all of this output. This is a two-part video, hopefully. Yep, all right. So we will jump over after all the tests have ran, because a run, they take about 20 minutes to run all those Microsoft tests. Oh. So we're going to find that failed test here in this output. There we go. So we can see that the passes and fails tests are not doing what they're saying, what they say they should be doing, because we changed that not equals to equals. So you can see that right in the output, which tests failed. And then we'll jump down here. You can see 198 passed, four failed, and the same 22 were skipped. And it didn't do anything else because it saw that pester test failed, so it's not going to build any VMs or comp you know, compress any modules or anything like that. It is just going to tell you that it failed and then record the pester results and mark the job as failed. Um, here we'll be able to see the test results. Oh, and it, this will actually, yeah, it's nice. I don't remember seeing this previously. This might have been added uh, to Jenkins in an update or something. Um, it'll actually tell you what commit it was uh, building off of and what changed your, uh, your change message itself, or your commit message. And it shows you twice for some reason. All right, we'll drop down to the test results themselves. You can see four failures. Four of my pester tests failed. And it gives you a little bit of info in there as well. All right, we'll move on to the next thing. Let's see here. Here's a change, a breaking change to your DSC configuration file itself. So those were unit tests for our custom DSC resource. 
Um, this next one, so since I, yeah, I mentioned earlier, this is doing more than just running pester tests. It's doing a, you know, it's testing our entire build, basically our entire build, our production build process. So here I'm going to make a change to that DSC configuration file itself. Um, Windows feature install. I don't think bad name is in a Windows feature, so we'll see. So we'll see that kick off a build again. And there's another part to that video as well. And we're just going to hop down right to the DSC. So this is within that DSC wizard script. It is going to try to generate the MA files. Oh, I take that back. All right, so since um, the authoring VM that you're writing, you're, you're generating the MOF files on doesn't know what features exist, so it doesn't care that you, that's a bad, that's a non-existent feature. So the MOF file generation process actually succeeds. It actually gets all the way down to the past the new VM build script, um, and it's actually going to fail within the, v, within the VM build script waiting for DSC to complete. And I think I just, it just went over that very quickly. So here you can see in the analytic or the uh, operational log is querying for errors. It found one. That feature doesn't exist. So it just, it fails completely. It doesn't do anything else. Uh, the last scenario is making a change to that, that controller script. So it's testing that too. That's I didn't mention that. What do we got here? All right. So here, the, I'm going to change our cluster parameter. So this is the the VMware cluster. Uh, we also don't have a bad cluster there, so that's going to cause it to fail. That is a very good question. Um, I believe all my time is tracked in our ticketing system, <laughs> but um, many hours, uh, many days, many hours. I I couldn't say. With uh, it was yeah, it's months. I mean, I'm constantly making changes to it, trying to add add new features, that sort of thing. Oh, I should have paused that. So we made the change. Committed the code, the build started, and then we got part two. All right, so the build kicked off. I guess we're going to show the changes again here. All right, you can see it's generating the MA files. It gets past that. Oh, but in the wizard, it tries to run the, start building the VMs, and it does not know what bad, bad cluster, what, what did I call it? Yeah, bad cluster was not found. So stop everything, don't do anything else. And it does not, so it doesn't even run the uh, remove VM step, because if your job is failing, you might want to log into those VMs and actually find out maybe something wrong is wrong within the VM itself, um, that sort of thing. So I believe that is the last scenario I have. Yep. So are there any questions about any of these? There's, there was a lot. It will, um, if you're interested in it, uh, there's, you can talk to me outside of, the, uh, outside of here as well in depth. Um, the code will all be up on GitHub. I can bring that up again if anyone wants to quickly snapshot that. Um, but yeah, any, uh, any questions? 
Oh, yep, I can totally show the groovy pipeline syntax. I hope. <laughs> yep. Uh, yes, I can put those up as well. VM should still be there, yep. Uh, nope, we, so that was a little less flexible than we needed it to be. We also had, before we even started DSC, we had our VMware build script done, working well. We've been using it for a while. I had to make very, very few, or Matt and I we had to make very few changes to actually get it to work with DSC and with this pipeline. Um, we switched from using a, uh, a CSV file as the input to using that configuration data uh, file as the input. All right, let's see if I can RDP into this thing. Awesome. Any other questions while this is starting up here? All right. 10,000 questions. Um, has anyone here heard of uh, DevOps Camp? All right, so that's a very small, like 20 people maximum conference that uh, Don Jones used to put on. This year it's put on, uh, being put on by uh, uh, Jeffrey, uh, Jeff Burnt, right? Yeah, Jeff Burnt, um, and Jason Helmbick. And it's, it's awesome. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it is an awesome conference. And I'm planning on actually showing a similar process, but with our Azure builds. So we have a big Azure environment build script that we're also, we have a whole pipeline for to test that. All right, so here within Jenkins, this is just a empty pipeline job I created. And then over here on the left, you can see pipeline syntax. So let's say I want to, I want to run a batch script. Well, let's see. Yeah, sure, why not? We'll return standard input. We'll return exit status. Oh, I can't do both of those. Fine. So it will only show up if you do if you create a pipeline job. It will not show up if you have a freestyle job. Yeah. So if you just create a blank pipeline job, empty one, it'll it'll be on the left there. So here's the pipeline script. You just copy and paste in your pipeline. Um, it's nice for th this was a pretty basic one. Uh, a more complex one is like a git checkout. There's so many options that you can do. That's, yes, that's groovy. Yep, you'd copy and paste that into your pipeline script. Um, there's a lot of stuff on, online on getting started with groovy. There's a lot specific to Jenkins that you can find. Um, so it's, even if you don't know it, it's, I, don't, I don't even call myself intermediate at groovy, but you can find what you need pretty easily. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I snoozed those. Why didn't it snooze? It said 30 days. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, we'll do, we'll build master. Let's add some advanced things. Yeah, let's do a shallow clone, sure. All right. Generate the pipeline script, and it generates the whole thing. You just, so you just copy and paste that entire block of text into your pipeline job, and it will take care of checking out your repository for you. Yep. Um, so if there's no other questions, I was just going to quickly mention or go over one other script I didn't show yet. This is part of the VM build script that actually jumps into the uh, part of the VM script that is getting like those analytic logs, how to pull those down, how to, how to show those. Find it here. All right. So our uh, the VM build script itself is actually building background jobs for every VM. Um, we let's see here. Yeah. So it's just building a background job for each VM so that you don't have to you know wait for 
one to finish before the other one starts. So then this, uh, once the build, once the VM build is complete, um, it runs this script within each VM. This one will you know, create some folders. It's, it's using invoke VM script or copy VM guest file for pretty much everything, which allows you to run code within your VM without having network access to it. Our, uh, our infrastructure VLAN is completely separate from all of our client VLANs. They can't talk back and forth, so this is the only way we could do this um, without like doing a run as like registry entry or something like that. Um, so here, let's get down to the good stuff. Selling the certificate. Oh, here we go. So I've got yeah a few error messages I don't care about, so I don't want the Jenkins job to fail if any of these come up because these actually don't cause DSC to fail. They, through over, over the years, they've, they've probably fixed most of these, but I just left them in. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of error messages that get thrown in that operational log that don't actually cause DSC to fail, so we'll ignore those. And then it's just doing a do while loop to query the event log, the analytic event log. And yep, here. So yeah. And this, this code will be up on, uh, on GitHub as well. So yeah, just basically a yeah, pretty simple git win event analytic. Grab the, grab the oldest one or, oh, you have to do oldest because they're, they record their events the opposite direction as any other event log. I think that's, I think that's the case for all analytic or debug event logs. But, so basically, yeah, query that, put it into an object, and then throw a verbose message out. Um, and then here's where we're looking for the current mo file, the current dot mo file. Once that exists, we can write the verbose message that the DSC configuration is complete. Um, and that is all I had. So, you want to get into any of your thousands of questions? I'd be happy to try to take a stab at them. But, oh. The Azure thing. Um, no, <laughs> I've got two minutes, so yeah. Uh, go to De go to DevOps Camp. <laughs> Did you, uh, um, when you're doing write error, uh, yep. is that passing standard error to the out of Jenkins, and then therefore it knows to fail the job? Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, yeah, it's writing the error to the job, and then within the new VM build, the new VM script that I haven't shown, um, that's actually, you know constantly querying the job.childjobs.error stream. So if it sees any of those, it writes a terminating error and just stops. And then all the Jenkins scripts, if you might have seen it, I'm setting the error action preference to stop at the beginning because I didn't want any error to cause this thing to fail. That comes through because in Jenkins, you're running it as a shell command, right? And then invoking PowerShell, I just want to make sure that. Um, in Jenkins, yes, I'm running, yep, yep. Yes. All right. So how are you handling all your credentialing? Is that part of like the, the credential store inside of GitLab? Is this part yep. I'm using, most of it is in GitLab. So for, actually for the pipeline, uh, for our automated testing, yes, it's all saved within Jenkins and that's saved uh, encrypted. It's encrypted on transit. Um, it's pretty well protected. Even if you, if someone were to write, you know, write out credential.getnetworkcredential.password, it'll actually asterisk that out. Like it, it knows what your password is and it's gonna not output that for you. All right, well, thank you.